Hello, my dear students. Welcome to Teacher at Home. Today, class, we are going to learn the sixth chapter, Poets and Pancakes. About the author, Ashoka Mitra, a Tamil writer, recounts his years at Gemini Studios in his book, My Years with Bose, which talks to the influence of movies on every aspect of life in India. Gemini Studios, located in Chennai, was set up in 1940. It was one of the most influential film producing organizations of India in the early days of Indian filmmaking. Its founder was S. S. Vasan. The duty of Ashok Mitra in Gemini Studios was to cut out newspaper clippings on a wide variety of subjects and store them in files. Many of these had to be written out by hand. Although he performed an insignificant function, he was the most well informed of all the members of the Gemini family. The following is an expert from his book, My Years with Bose. Notice these words and expression in the text infer their meaning from the context. Blue hour, capatura filtered into, played into their hands, heard a bill ringing. Was struck down, a call of mail, the favorite hunt. Pancake was the brand name of the makeup material that Gemini Studios bought in truck lots. Greta Garbo must have used it. Miss Gower must have used it. Vajendi Mala must also have used it, but Radhi Aknavatri may not have even heard of it. The makeup department of the Gemini Studios was in the upstairs of the building that was believed to have been Robert Clyde's tables. A dozen other buildings in the city are said to have been his residence. For his brief life uh, and a uh, even briefer stay in Madras, Robert Clyde seems to have done a lot of moving besides fighting some impossible battles in remote corners of India and marrying a maiden in St. Mary's Church in Fort St. George in Madras. The makeup room had the look of a hair-cutting salon with lights at all angles, around half a dozen large mirrors. They were all in candies and lights, so you can imagine the fiery misery of those subjected to makeup. The makeup department was first headed by a Bengali who became too big for a studio and left. He was succeeded by a Maharashtrian who was assisted by a Darwar, Kanadi, Ga and Andhra, a Madras Indian Christian, Anglo, Burmese and the usual local Tamils. All this shows that there was a great deal of national integration long before AIR and Doordarshan began broadcasting programs on national integration. This gang of nationality integrative makeup men who turn any decent looking person into hideous crimson hunt monster with the help of a track lots of pancake and a number of other locally made potions and lotions. Those were the days of initially indoor shooting and only 5% of the film was shoot outdoors. I suppose the sets and studio lights needed the girls and boys to be made to look ugly in order to look presentable in the movie. A strict hierarchy was maintained in the makeup department. A chief makeup man made the chief actors and actresses ugly. The senior assistant, second hero and heroine, the junior assistant, the main comedian and so forth who played the crowd were the responsibility of the office boy. Even the makeup department of the Gemini studio had an office boy. On those days, when there was a crowd shooting, you could see him mixing his paint in a giant vessel, slapping it on the crowd players. The idea was to close every pore on the surface of the face in the process of applying makeup. He wasn't exactly a boy. He was in his early 40s, having entered the studios a year ago in the hope of becoming an actor a star actor or a top screen writer, director or lyrics writer. He was a bit of a poet. In those days, I worked for it. I worked in a cubicle, two whole sides of which, uh, uh, which were French windows. I did not know at that time they were called French windows. Seeing me sitting at my desk, tearing up newspapers day in and out, most people thought I was doing next to nothing. It is likely that the boss thought likewise too. So anyone who felt it should be some occupation would bargage into the my cubicle, deliver an extended lecture. The boy in the makeup department had decided I should be enlightened to on how great literary talent it was being allowed to go waste in a department fit only for bar, barbers and perverts. Soon I was praying for crowd shooting all the time. Nothing short of it could save me from his epics. In all instances of a frustration, 
you will always find the anger directed towards a single person openly or covertly and this man of the makeup department was convinced that all his woes always was ignominy and neglect were due to kadangalam subbu subbu was the number one at gemini studio she couldn't have had a more encouraging opening in films than our grown up makeup boy had on the contrary he must have had to face more uncertain and difficult times for when he began his career there were no family established from film producing companies or studios even in the matter of education especially formal education subbu couldn't have had appreciable led over our body our boy but by virtue of being born a brahmin a virtue indeed he must have had exposure to more affluent situations and people he had the ability to look cheerful at all times even after having had a hand in the flock fully he always had work for somebody he could never do things on his own but his sense of loyalty made him identify himself with his principles completely and turn his entire creativity to his principles advantage he was tailor made for films he was a man who could be inspired when commanded the rat fights the tigress under water and kills her but takes pity on the cubs and lends him love lovingly i do not know how to do the scene the producer would say and subbu would come out with four ways of the rat pouring affection on the victims of springs good but i am not sure it is effective enough the producer would say in a minute subbu would come out with the 14 more alternatives film making must have been was so easy with a man like subbu around and if ever there was a man who gave direction and definition to gemini studios during its golden years it was subbu subbu had a separate entity as a poet and he thought the and though he was certainly capable of more complex and higher forms he deliberately chose to address his poetry to the masses the success in films overshadowed and dwarfed his literary achievements on uh, or so his critics felt he composed uh, several truly original story poems in folk refrain and diction and also wrote a sprawling novel tilana nonambar with the dozens of very defectly etched characters he quite successfully recreated the mode and the manner of devadasis in the early 20th century he was an amazing actor he never aspired to the lead roles but whatever subsidiary role he played in all the films uh, he p- performed better than the supposed supposed to main players he had a genuine love for anyone he came across and his house was a permanent residence for dozens or near for relations and acquaintances it seemed again subbu's nature to be even conscious that he was feeding and supporting so many of them such a charitable and improvident man yet he had enemies was it because he seemed so close and intimate with the boss or was it his general demeanor that resembled a psychophants or his readiness to say nice things about everything in any case there was this man in the makeup department who would wish the direct things for subbu he saw subbu always with the boss but in the attendance roles he was grouped under a department called the story department comprising a lawyer and assembly of writers and poets the lawyer was also officially known as the legal advisor but everybody referred to him as the opposite as extremely talented actresses who was also extremely temperamental the ones blew over on the sets while everyone stood stern the lawyer quietly switched on the recording equipment when the actress paused for a breath the lawyer said to her one minute please and played back the recording there was nothing incriminating or unmentionably foul about the actress that tried against the producer but when she heard her voice again through the sound equipment she was struck dumb a girl from widely experienced that generally precede a position of importance and sophistication that she had found herself capitulated into she never quite uh, recovered from the terror she felt that day this was the end of the brief and brilliant acting career the legal advisor who was also a member of the story department had unwittingly brought about that sad end while every other member of the department wore a kind of uniform khadi dhoti with a slightly oversized and clumsily tailored white khadi shirt legal advisor wore pants and a tie and sometimes a coat that looked like a coat of the maid often he looked alone and helpless a man of cold logic in a crowd of dreamers 
a neutral man in the assembly of Gandhi Tears and Kadites. Like so many of these who were close to the boss, was also allowed to produce a film, and though a lot of raw stock and pancake were used on it, not came much of the film. Then one day the boss closed down the story department. It was perhaps the only instance that in all human history where a lawyer lost his jobs because the poets were asked to do a go home. Gemini Studios was a favorite hunt of poets like S. D. S. Yogya, Sangu Subramanian, Krishna Sastri, and Had. Harindranath Chadobadeya. It had an excellent mess which supplied good coffee at all times of the day and for most part of the night. Those were the days when Congress ruled men prohibition and meeting over a cup of coffee and rather satisfying entertainment. Barring the boy of his boys and a couple of clerks, everybody else to the studios radiated leisure, a prerequisite for poetry. Most of them woke Kadi and worshipped Gandhiji, but beyond that they had not the faintest appreciation for political thought of any kind. Naturally, they were all adverse to the term communi communism. A communist was a godless man. He had no filial or conjugal love. He had no com uh, compunction about killing his own parents or his children. He was always out to cause and spread unrest and violence. Among innocent and innocent people, such no notions which prevailed everywhere else in South India at that time also naturally floated about vaguely among the Kadi clad poets of Jimmy Studios. Evidence of it was soon forthcoming when Frank Bachman's moral rearmament army, some 200 strong, visited Madras sometime in 1952. They could not have found a warmer host in India than the Jimmy Studios. Someone called the group an international circus. They were in very good on their trapetes and their acquaintance with animals was only their dinner table. But they prevented, presented two plays in a most professional manner. Their jaw and value and the forgotten factor ran several shows in Madras and along with the other citizens of the city, the Gemini family of 600 saw the plays over the over and again. The message of the plays were usually plain and simple homeless. But the sets and costumes were first rate. Madras and the Tamil drama community were terribly impressed and for some years, almost all Tamil plays had a scene of sunrise and sunset in the manner of Jodham Valley with a bar stage, a white background, curtain and a tune played on the flute. It was some years later that I learned that MRA was a kind of counter movement to international communism and big boss of Madras like Mr. Watson simply played into the hands. I am not sure, however, that this was indeed this case for the unchangeable aspects of these big bosses and their enterprises remain the same. MRA or no MRA, international communism or no international communism, the staff of Gemini Studios had a nice time hosting 200 people of all hues and sizes of at least 20 nationalities. It was such a change from the usual co collection of crowd players waiting to be slapped with the thick layers of makeup by the office boy in the makeup department. A few months later, the telephone lines of the big bosses of Madras buzzed and once again, we at Gemini Studios cleared a whole shooting stage to welcome another visitor. All they said was that he was a poet from England. He only poet from England. The simple Gemini staff knew or heard of where Wordsworth and Tennyson, the more literate ones, knew of Keats, Shelley and Byron, and one or two might have Faintly come to know of someone by the name Elliot, who was a poet visiting the Gemini Studios now. He is not a poet, he is an editor. That's why the boss is giving him a big reception. Vasan was also an editor of the popular Tamil weekly, Ananda Vigida. He wasn't the editor of any one of the known names of British publications. In Madras, that is those known in Gemini Studios, since the top man of the Hindu were taking the initiative, the surnames was the poet was the editor of the daily, but now not the Manchester Guardian of the law, of the London Times. That was all that even the most well informed among us knew. At last, around four in the afternoon, the poet arrived. He was a tall man, very English, very serious, and of course very unknown to all of us, battling with half of dozen pedestal fans on the shooting stage. The boss read out a long speech. It was obvious that he too knew precious little about the poet. The speech was all about the most general terms 
but here and there it was peppered with words like freedom and democracy then the poet spoke he could not have addressed a more dazed and silent audience no one knew that he was talking about his ascent defeated any attempt to understand what he was saying the whole thing lasted about an hour and the poet left and was dispersed in utter ba- bafflement what are we doing this is an english poet making in doing in a film studio which makes tamil films for the shorter sort of people people who lives at least step uh, he lives afforded them in the possibility of cultivating a taste for english poetry the poet looked the pretty baffled to for he too must have felt the sheer incongruity of his talk about the thrills and travels of an english poet his visit remained an unexplained mystery the great prose writers of the world may not admit it but my confession grows shorter day after day that prose writing is not and cannot be the true pursuit of a genius it is for the patient a persistent persevering drudge with a heart so strong and that nothing can break it rejection slips do not mean a thing to him he at once sets about making a fresh copy of the long prose piece and send to another editor enclosing post postage for the return of the manuscript it was for such people that hindu had published a tiny announcement in an insignificant corner of an unimportant page a short story contest organized by a british periodically by the name encounter of course the encounter wasn't a non commodity among the gemini literati i wanted to get an idea of the periodical before i spent a considerable sum in postage sending a manuscript to england in those days the british council a library and an entrance with a long long winded sign boards and notices to make you feel you were seeking into a forbidden area and there were copies of the encounter lying about in various degrees of freshness almost untouchable by readers when i read the editor's name i heard a bell ringing in my shrunken heart it was the poet who had visited the gemini studios i felt like i had found a long lost brother and sang and i sealed the envelope and wrote out his address i felt that he would be singing the same song at the same time long lost brothers of indian films discover each other by singing the same song in the first reel and the final reel of the film St- uh, stephen S- spender stephen was that was its name years later when i was out of gemini studios and had much time but not much money anything at a reduced price attracted my attention on the footpath of the front of the madras mount road post office there was a pile of bra- brand new books for the 50 paise each actually there were copies of the same book elegant paperback of the american origin special low prices student edition the connection with the 50th century of the russian revolution i paid 50 paise and picked up a copy of the book the god that failed six eminent men of letters in six separate essays described up their journeys into the communication and their uh, dissolution return on their side richard bright ignacio nesilon arthur kochler louis fisher and stephen spender stephen spender suddenly a book assumed a tremendous significance uh, stephen spender the poet who had visited gemini studios in a moment i felt a dark chamber of my side mind uh, lit up in a hazy illumination the reaction of a stephen spender at gemini studios was no longer a mystery the boss of the gemini studios was not much of to do with the spender's poetry but not with the gods that failed so that's all about this chapter if you are interested please do like share and subscribe my channel okay thank you